All right, we are ready to go on our keynote speaker presentation today. I might add it's our last event of the Inclusion Collaborative fourth annual 2017 state conference. <gasps> I know all my staff are very excited. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, we will be virtually streaming this. Hello, virtual people. You can't hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, you should come out of the light. Yes. You're gonna, no, right, because that's where the camera is. Right. It's a new camera guy here. <gasps> Anyways, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you, um, what do you want to be called? Mr. Jim Reed. He's got a few jobs. He's going to share those with you, but um, he took time out of his busy schedule because he really believes in what the Inclusion Collaborative does, and this is a state conference, so Jim is on a virtual stream all over the state. Isn't that exciting? So thank you for being here. That's a first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Well, good morning. Uh, hey, come on, we've got beautiful weather out here. Good morning. There we go. All right. All right, exactly. You could hear them over the connection. So it's, it's so great to be with you, and uh, it's so great to see the smiling faces that we have here. It's anytime you're involved in a, uh, in a field of work where people are able to just give their soul and put their heart into everything that they're doing professionally. Um, you can see it in the faces, and you see it in the faces of the people that are around here uh, now. Uh, on behalf of Mayor Locardo, I'm uh, his chief of staff. I want to welcome you to San Jose. Uh, welcome you on behalf of Councilman uh, Lund Yep in District 4, whose district we're in. We're overjoyed that you're, uh, that you're here today, and we're especially grateful for all the wonderful work of the County Office of Education and the Inclusion Collaborative. Um, this is a partnership. This is a partnership that does so much for residents of Santa Clara County and really throughout Silicon Valley. Uh, and it's one we're more than uh, honored to support in the little way that, uh, that we can. Um, and so I want to thank you for what you're doing for all of the residents of, uh, of our community. Above all, I also want to thank you uh, as a parent. So uh, I've got a special needs kiddo. And, you know, if when, when you're a special needs parent and you get a curveball thrown at you, a lot of times... Uh, you can feel awfully alone. Uh, you don't know where to turn. You feel like the things that you're going through, nobody's ever been through them before. And you can, get, you can let yourself get isolated really, really quickly. And it's a scary feeling. And the thing that gets you out of that quick and makes you realize that you're going to get through it and your kid is going to thrive is when you're able to connect with other people who've been through the same thing and have experiences to share and have that, uh, that warm hug to give you when you need it and the shoulder to cry on now and then. And that's what the Inclusion Collaborative is all about and that's why the city is so fortunate to have you doing what you're doing. And again, I as a parent, thank you so much for everything thank that you're you. doing for all of our kids. So the, the great news is uh, you're about to hear from an absolute dynamite speaker who's, uh, who's the keynote today. And um, I'm going to be, she's very modest, and she said, please don't read my bio. And I said, well, I just got to talk a little bit about some of the cool things that you've done. So I promise I'll be brief. So Zaretta Hammond is a former uh, classroom English teacher who has been doing instructional design, school coaching, and professional development around issues of equity, literacy, and culturally responsive teaching for the past 10, 18 years. She teaches as a lecturer at the St. Mary's College Kalamazoo School. Uh, close enough. In, in addition to consulting and professional development, she has been on staff for the national education reform organizations, including the National Equity Project and the former Bay Area School Reform Collaborative. She's regularly invited to present at national and regional conferences such as this and has authored articles that have appeared in national publications such as Phi Beta Kappen. She currently is designing literacy programs to accelerate low reading skills among high school students, and she holds a master's in secondary English education. And here's most important of all, she also writes a blog called readyforrigor.com. So that's readyforrigor.com, worth checking out. I checked it out after I saw her, uh, her um, bio, and uh, there's a bunch of fascinating stuff in there. Whether you're a practitioner or a parent, there's, uh, there's great learning that, uh, that she's got up there. She's a proud parent of two adult children, both of whom she taught to read before they went to, uh, to school. And she re resides in Berkeley with her, uh, her husband and family. So, doctor, thank you for being with us today. <laughs> thank you. That's right. I might. I don't even have to grab the mic. Um, can you guys hear me just fine? Great. So, one clarification. I'm not doctor. Um, hello, virtual people. Uh, 
I am a, a former classroom teacher, and I, it is from my practice that I came to a lot of this work and that I'll be sharing with you today. And I make that point up front because the reality is what you're doing on the ground is where the knowledge is actually created. It's not created in an ivy tower. It's created when we are shoulder to shoulder with each other, and we are with children and families. So just want to say that up front, all right? So what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about a key part of being uh, responsive to any group of children is helping them be independent learners to the level that they can. Their optimum zone of genius, that means we have to help them find their natural competence. And what I have experienced is a lot of children who are marginalized for whatever reason, um, special needs, um, race, class, language, they lose their natural competence. So part of what I want to be able to do is just really talk about this idea of uh, wayfinding. And wayfinding, I think, is a, a really important topic. Um, and it's not a thing we usually talk about. I talk about it because there are a few things that people who know me know. One is I love Marvel movies and cannot wait for the next one to come out. I think Thor comes out in November 3rd or something, and I will be in line. Yes, I will. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing they know about me is I could not find my way out of a paper bag. So if someone dropped me in the woods like that, oh, well, that's Zaretta. She was really a nice lady <laughs> because I would not be getting home. I just have no sense of direction. I did not get in that line when they were passing out abilities. Um, and so I think this is really an important idea that part of what we try to do in life, if we use the metaphor of finding our way and map reading, is this idea that we need to be able to find our way to our ultimate competence, to our ultimate confidence. And I love this idea because it's grown out of my own experience. The picture that you see there on the left is where I grew up in San Francisco. My grandparents came out as part of the uh, last wave of the black migration in 1940 to San Francisco. My grandmother was a domestic. She, neither one of them could read. My grandfather was a longshoreman. And they had strong backs and therefore could find meaningful work and could make a fairly decent living at that. Um, my mother was a teen parent and had three children by the time she was 22. And so we grew up in the projects in Hunters Point in San Francisco. But I found my way to Sather Gate at UC Berkeley. And that was a long journey. And along the way, I had to find my natural confidence because there were things along the way, because I'd come from the background I came from, that wanted to erode that, to wanted to uh, um, imply that I was less than, less intelligent, less capable. And I had people who were there to help me understand that, but also to build my capacity. So part of what I talk about when I do this work is this idea of how do we, as adults, uh, help children find their way. So wayfinding, it is a word we don't see often, but it is a noun. And it means all the ways in which people, animals, orient themselves in physical space and navigate from place to place. They actually have a kind of a adventure thing where you can learn how to read maps and orient yourself. And I keep threatening to take that, but not yet. Um, but it also means signs, maps, and other geographic uh, or audible methods used to convey location and direction to travelers, right? So what are the signs? What are the maps? What are the, the, the signposts that allow a student to know that they're moving in the right direction? And so a lot of times that comes with some types of instruments. Those are the, the um, wayfinding instruments that sailors use. But the reality is there are a group of people that use no instruments. They learned how to read the land around them. And Pacific Islanders have a long tradition of deep knowledge of how to navigate without instruments. 
And often we think we need school to show us the way. What we need is to find the way to read the signs in our own path. And every child has that path. We need to just help them be the leaders of their own learning. Um, no no uh, instruments necessary. The Polynesians helped us understand that. We even saw this play out in a uh, Disney movie, right? The idea that wayfinding is a critical skill that everybody needs. That ability to read the signposts, to create your own map in order to do this, right? Because there are different paths. One path is going to lead you down the path of failure. And every experience is either going to help a child feel confident or it's going to erode that. And we know how to help that child find the right way. So this is why I wrote my book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, because I wanted people to really understand what I'd learned after 20 years, 20 plus years at this point, of really helping people change the path and the outcome for children that are traditionally marginalized. The idea that equity wasn't just a word that we used to talk about implicit bias, but it was really about helping children find their way, helping children find that confidence. So highlighting the neuroscience was really important because we have to understand what are the things that we need to do to help the student build the brain power for social emotional wellness. And that's a bit about uh, what I want to be able to unpack today. So here's a big idea. It's all about the kids, right? Sometimes we get kind of lost on this message. Uh, every teaching strategy used, every policy we put in place, every professional experience is really about making a difference in the lives of children. So what I want to share with you today, again, is not so much a how-to, but what's the right stuff that we should be orienting ourselves to? How do we help vulnerable and marginalized students find their way back to their natural genius and confidence? What is our individual and collective role in social, emotional, cognitive wayfinding? What does that look like? Because they're not mutually exclusive, but they all need to be attended to. Here is a quote that I really love by Rita Pearson. And Every child deserves a champion, she says, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection, insists they become the best that they can be. Wayfinding begins with having a champion. I write in culturally responsive teaching in the brain about two champions I had. One was my fifth grade teacher, Miss Morris. Miss Morris was no joke. She was like the ultimate in the warm demand or no nonsense nurturer, if you will. And she was about helping me step my game up. So she wasn't letting me kind of slide and just kind of, oh, I'm just going to kind of go low level here. She was always on me to kind of up my game. And she had the belief that I could do that. I had the capacity, and I just wasn't tapping it. She helped me tap that. The other was my 10th grade um, English teacher, Mr. Ruane. He was also the football coach, so he was tall had a bald head, kind of looked like Dr. Phil. And he was um, the teacher of my black English class. It would be African American literature today. Um, but I thought when I came into that class, now what does this white man know about black literature? And he's got a room full of black kids. This was in the 70s, right, with our radical notions. And he was so comfortable in his skin, his ability to help us be comfortable looking at, reflecting on our lives in ways that we felt seen and heard, and for him to create that kind of atmosphere. In addition, he was kind of in my ear about being my true self. He'd see when I kind of dumbed down my intelligence, and he'd encourage me by a little word as I was walking out of the classroom to, to be true to myself, to speak up and share that answer. And when necessary, not to sell myself short. I remember writing a paper, and that paper was, you know, the C paper. Like, you know, I just cranked that out. And I handed it in, and, you know, I knew the content, so I could just crank it out, not give it much thought. He read it, and he literally slid it back to me. He says, you could do so much better than this. 
I will pretend I never saw this, and I will give you another day. And I just stopped in my tracks, like, oh, he did not just call me out. <laughs> oh, yes, he did. And that changed everything for me. He was pointing me in a direction. He says, you don't want to go down that road. This is the road you want to go down. And I'm going to call you on it by blocking that road. I will not accept this level of work from you because I see you. I know you are capable of so much more. So many of our students are getting mixed messages that they're not capable. And they internalize it. The older they get, the longer they get in school, they internalize those messages. We have to be the counter narrative to that. We have to have that proxy vision. We have to be their merchants of hope that there is another way. I am capable. I can grow my brain power. But if they don't ever get that message, and if it's all about the grade on the paper, and working through this content, and they're feeling stuck, then they're never going to get there. Here's what I'd love for you to do. I want you to think about, and it's usually not far from our memory, who is your champion? Think about who was that person. It could be a teacher. It could be someone in some other part of your life. But that was a champion that let you know, hmm, more is possible for me. So I'd love for you at your table, just with a partner, just do a turn and talk, share who, who was your champion and why was that person special in that role. Go ahead and take a couple of minutes. All right, start to wrap up your thought. Start to wrap up your thought and let's come back together. So if you can hear my voice, go ahead and just raise your hand. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Go ahead, wrap up your thought. Let's come back together. All right, nudge a friend. <laughs> All right, thank you for engaging that. Here's what I'd like to do. I'm gonna go I'm going to go forward and sharing. So someone says they can't hear me back there. Who's controlling the volume? Somebody got me on mute? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> All right, 
Let's see where we can clip this thing. Okay, virtual people. Hopefully you can hear me too. All right, is that better? Yeah? Okay, good. Make sure I look straight forward, speak up. Fantastic. Well, let's jump in here because what I want to do is I'm going to take you through some of these core concepts in terms of how culturally responsive practices actually lead to students having that uh, pathway toward natural confidence. And then as we're going along, you know, definitely be jotting down your questions. So we'll be taking questions. I'll be making some time at the end for us to, to you know, comment and reflect and have some questions as well as to take some from our virtual audience as well. So let's jump in here. What I want to be able to do is start by unpacking three common terms. Multicultural education, social justice education, culturally responsive education. I think a lot of times we get these very mixed up. And so I want to be able to unpack it. So let's take a few of those words off. So first we start with multicultural education. That is focused on celebrating diversity. And that's a very important thing. But you'll notice something about it. It is centered around helping kids get it along with each other. Social justice focuses on exposing the social political context and really helping students think about the world outside of school or the, the context in which they are living in. Culturally responsive education focuses on improving the learning capacity of diverse students, using culture as both an affective scaffold and a cognitive scaffold. Multicultural, again, centers around positive interactions across difference, whereas the social political, I mean, the social justice really centers around raising students' consciousness. Culturally responsive is about the cognitive aspects of teaching and learning, and I will add the affective aspects of teaching and learning. You're going to notice a couple of things. Multiculturalism has nothing to do with learning. So if your student is reading two grade levels behind, you can bring all the multicultural, it's a small world stuff in, and that's not going to change a darn thing. Social justice the same way. You can look at and reflect on some of the injustices that are out there, some of the inequities, but if the student doesn't have confidence in his or her own ability, that consciousness raising doesn't change that. It's going to change the fact that they don't know how long vowels work. And I see an overinvestment in multiculturalism and in social justice when what we need to be able to do is better understand what is this thing we call culturally responsive practice. And being able to understand kind of how that will impact. So the last part, multicultural concerns itself with exposing privileged students to diverse literature. As a, people talk about window, right? Windows and mirrors. So that's a window for those students who don't have that experience. For students of color, for other marginalized populations, bringing in literature that reflects their experience is talked about as a mirror. And again, we think it's a self-esteem. Great, they're going to see themselves and will be on a different trajectory. This, this is important, but not sufficient in and of itself. It has to be part of a larger strategy that allows you to be responsive. So what I'm not saying is multiculturalism is unimportant. I'm saying it is not culturally responsive practice. And being able to incorporate all three of these becomes the ultimate goal. I'm going to go back to social justice. Concerns itself with creating that lens. And again, that lens, when the student comes to having to take a standardized test or to work on a project, is not always helpful. And those skills needed to navigate that. Whereas culturally responsive teaching really, at its core, helps the student build that resilience. And we're going to talk about how does it do that. Because we get caught up on the culture part when we should be thinking about the responsive part. The responsive is the student is presenting himself or herself to you in some way. How will you respond? 
the more you know that student, the more you can leverage their bodies of knowledge. You can match that and be in sync. That's the cultural part. We'll unpack a little bit of that. But the real question is how do we become more responsive to students? And what I suggest is we have to do what the Heath brothers in this book switch. I don't know if any of you have read it. If you haven't, you should put it on your reading list. Because they talk about how you actually navigate change. And again, that idea of wayfinding, how do we find our way to a practice that actually makes a difference for students? The first is you have to think about how to shape the path. And he talked about it in three ways. The writer is our rational mind, the technical piece. <laughs> then the elephant is our emotional, social emotional response to what's going on. But the most important part is the shaping of the path. And that path tells us the sorts of things that are going to help the student respond in a more positive way. How can we map with signposts that are practices that help us? So it's just a metaphor to help us think about, again, how do we create the experiences? Because here's what neuroscience tells us in a nice little graphic that all learning happens because learners know how to transverse the learning pit. And the learning pit starts with us understanding that learning gets hard. We're whistling along and, ooh, learning just got hard because I am confused. And that is a natural state of learning. For students who have become dependent learners or not competent learners, struggling learners, whatever label we're putting on them, they believe their confusion or their, their struggle is a sign of their low intelligence. And we need to help them reframe it because all learners get confused. And what is most important is that that learner feel confident about going into the pit. So going into the pit is related to social emotional well-being, a sense of confidence in oneself. That this doesn't mean anything other than, oh, I don't quite understand how these things fit together. So what you say to yourself on the way down into the pit is going to determine where the learning can be active. And that is a critical part of what we have to help students do. We have to help them not freak out before they get to the, the bottom of that pit because that's where the good stuff is, believe it or not. Right? That wall is what Vygotsky talks about is the zone of proximal development. He talks about that you actually have to go through this productive struggle because that's where your brain grows. So every time we deprive students of productive struggle, we deprive them of being on the path to growing their brain power. They need that. We just have to help them be confident enough to stay in the ZPD. How do we do that? And that is an important piece. Now, the other part to that is how do you get up out of that pit? I had my fun with productive struggle. OK, I'm ready to get out of there. Well, this is where information processing comes. That ability to process information where you can see two things you can chew on them, and you get to your aha moment. Oh, I see how these are connected. I get it. This is what we keep talking about upping understanding. We want kids to have their aha moment, where they know how to chew on that content and make sense of it, make meaning of it. So that is the neuroscience of learning. But if we can't get the brain to be calm going down, then the student will not have that experience of learning. Now, here's what's really interesting. They get really good at being compliant and faking it, right? They look like they're going through the motions. But at some point, you figure out, oh, you didn't really understand what that content was about. How do I help you do that? Because here's where our students are. Phil Schelecti talked about this idea of engagement, student engagement. He says, ultimately, we want students to be engaged at that high level. That's that green dot. He says, it's made up of two things, high attention, ah, this has my imagination, I'm curious about it, hmm, I'm leaning in, what are we going to do here? And high commitment, and the high commitment is to the hard part. 
that mm, in the midst of trying to figure this out, it's going to get hard. All right, but I'm committed. At the bottom, we see rebellion and retreatism, right? That's the, I'm just going to put my hoodie over my head. Or, you know, the student's just like, oh, I'm just not going to say anything. In the middle there is what we have most often. Strategic compliance, that's the kid who raises a hand and says, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> the only reason I'm paying attention, right? And the next one is ritual compliance. This is like, I'm in the seat because I'm told I need to be in the seat, not because I'm motivated to be in the seat. We want to move students beyond compliance. That's what this work is really about. We want them to find the joy of learning and that the joy of learning can be found at the bottom of the learning pit, that the pit is not something to be feared. Maybe you want to go with partners. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to go alone. Vygotsky says that. He says, you always go with someone, because most people will not subject themselves to that level of discomfort that triggers brain growth. We can't tolerate confusion. That's why it's best to learn in community. But we have to first deal with the social-emotional elements. Remember, going down into the pit is about how we feel. So I want to share with you a little bit of the neuroscience. This is your brain on trust. Right? Because when we think of being responsive, we haven't got to the culture part yet, but being responsive starts with understanding this. And in my book, I have a whole chapter that's about kind of the neuroscience and the structure of the brain. And, you know, people are like, oh, I need a highlighter for that chapter. I said, I'm going to just pull out the three things that you need to know. <laughs> right? And these are the three things. The idea that these three parts of our central nervous system play a critical role in learning that we usually don't attend to. So the first is our sympathetic. This is part of our safety threat system. Our brain is designed to keep us safe. So the central nervous system's first order of business is to figure out what do you need to stay away from? There are places and spaces you don't need to go into. And I'm going to let you know what those are by triggering a response that will release cortisol, right? These are things we avoid. Now, what's interesting is the brain reacts to social situations as painful in the same way that it reacts to physical pain. The same parts of the brain light up. A student believes he's going to be humiliated or shamed, right? Feeling vulnerable. All of those things that we feel if we feel we're being attacked or in some unsafe space, brain goes through the same thing in terms of social. So the problem with students coming in having too much cortisol or being triggered in class by situations where they don't feel confident is this idea that cortisol, it's not even an idea, it's what we know about what cortisol does to the body and the brain, it shuts down all executive function for about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the student. And it stays in the body up to three hours. So it's really important for us to understand if we're building trust, the first order of business is to reduce the cortisol and knowing how to do that. First part of being responsive, is knowing how to do that. Second, we'll look at is the parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic is this part of the brain that secretes dopamine. Dopamine is the yummiest, most addictive chemical in the brain. We all want a little more dopamine, right? This is why we all need a 12-step program for our phones. Because <laughs> every time we look at the phone, Every time we go on Facebook and we see how many likes we got on that post, our brain is secreting dopamine. And it says, oh, that was yummy. You think if I wrote another post, I can get another hit of that dopamine? <laughs> and we keep looking at our phones. <laughs> so this idea of secreting dopamine, serotonin, how do we trigger that in the classroom? So getting kids in that right place of social-emotional readiness for learning means being able to manipulate these two. And the last one I want to throw in here, we don't talk a lot about, but as educators, we really should be having a little more conversation about the vagus nerve, right? Polyvagal, because that vagus nerve is the only one that does not go into the 
spinal column and instead comes out of the brain stem and terminates in your stomach. And along the way, it branches out so that there are parts of the vagus that are in our neck and in our shoulders and upper back. And what the vagus nerve is responsible for is reducing our stress, keeping us calm, secreting oxytocin that gets us feeling that we are connected. When your oxytocin is low, and it's our bonding chemical, our social connection chemical, that's when you think, hmm, I think I need to have a barbecue and invite some folks over. Or, hmm, I haven't seen my girls. We need a girls weekend, right? This is oxytocin talking to you. It's low. <laughs> and you're trying to up your oxytocin. Why is oxytocin important in the classroom? Because it outside of time and exercise is the only thing that will reverse the effects of cortisol. And this is an important piece to rebuild students' natural confidence. You can't control the things that are outside in their lives. Too often when we talk about inclusion and students that are marginalized, we have a tendency to talk about those issues out there. There's trauma in their lives and they've got this and there's poverty in their lives. Well, the reality is none of those things are new. But what we can do is shift the brain chemistry in our classroom. It doesn't mean that we're sitting around singing kumbaya all day. <laughs> We've got work to do. But it means that when you're responsive, particularly culturally responsive, you're using elements to actually trigger this sequence and maintain it. And there are small things that you will be able to do. We're going to talk about some of those as we go forward, because this is what you're trying to avoid. You're trying to avoid the amygdala hijack. That the amygdala has a special permission by the rest of the brain that if anything is really threatening us, you get to override any kind of rational thinking and just like get us the heck out of there. But the fact is it misreads things. It's kind of like, you know, short triggered. Like, I think that is threatening, so we're going to release some cortisol right now. And so, again, the student can be in this high level of stress without necessarily experiencing any relief from it. So, part of what we're understanding is how do we keep that amygdala from triggering? This is where those brain chemistries come in. If it detects high levels of oxytocin, it says, I can stand down. All's good here. If it detects high levels of cortisol, we need to go into action. We're going to override every other system, and our main job is to keep you safe. So it's really getting people to understand that chemistry. So here's the truth bomb. Culture is the software to the brain's hardware. Right? If this is the hardware, then what is telling us what we should feel afraid of? what we should feel connected to. This is where we couple culture with that sense of trust. And there are three levels of culture. Surface culture, and surface culture is where multiculturalism lives. It's the food we eat, the things we drink, the music, the dance. The, these are the surface things. And this is why people think, oh, we're being culturally responsive, but, but you're really being multicultural. Then at the bottom you have deep culture. These are the values. These are the ways of being that are important, that are lived through a community. Usually they're not conscious, but people know this is a, this is a main tenet of what it means to live in this community. But in the middle is really where you can bring this into the classroom. Because these are the ways of interacting. These are the nonverbal ways of making that trust connection. So being able to understand shallow culture, how that plays in, and this is not that kind of stuff like, oh, certain kids don't like to make eye contact, right? We get this kind of reductionist way of pigeonholing different cultural groups or racial groups. But the reality is that we can reduce this really to the continuum of individualism and collectivism that these two cultural orientations exist on a continuum. 
Neither one is good or bad. It's just they're on a continuum from 100, very individualistic, to zero, very collectivist. So let's take a look at what this means. Individualism is really the main cultural focus in our classrooms right now. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps is the main tenet. It's focused on individual achievement. Contributions and status are really important. Who gets that gold star, right? Very competitive around those types of objects, whatever those may be, because they relate to status. Very technical and analytical. Collectivism is, on the other hand, I am because we are. It's the idea of we over me. Doesn't mean that people aren't individuals, but the individual is always thinking in relationship to self and contribution to the group. Focus on that interdependence and the group success. It doesn't mean that, oh, those kids just like to do things in groups. That's what I hear when people are being culturally responsive. Oh, collectivism means just get them to do a lot of group work. That's not what it means. This means even as an individual, I'm thinking beyond myself. Collaborative oriented to deeper relationships. Re relational and reflective would be key words. So if we had to look at where the United States is in relationship to cultural orientation. I, mean to, I, I don't know if you can see that, but there we are, right at the top. We're 91. We are the most individualistic country on the planet. And this work is done in business and in government and in the military. They use these scales to help prepare our diplomats. So I'm, this is not me just kind of pulling this and making this up. What I've tried to do in this book is to actually weave together what is already out there for us to understand this. This is how we're already training our diplomats and our military personnel. So we, yet we don't train ourselves as educators around it. I want you to find where some of your students are coming from other cultural orientations, other uh, countries. Any observations? Got good eyes and you can read that. <laughs> Anybody want to venture? An observation that you're making? Right over here. Uh, say, name a name. <laughs> say what you, we're safe. We're just among friends. What, what were you looking at? Uh, China is what number? And it's higher in terms of more individualistic. Yeah. So what's interesting about this is. Sometimes we think of countries in relationship to their business operation in the world, right? So even in China, they've taken on Western culture. So they do education better than we do education. But that is not the culture that people raise their children in. And what I mean is we get coded, our brains are wired around our cultural orientation by the time we're seven, from birth to seven. So Kids aren't in school. So that's, if you actually look at, go to the countryside of China, it's a very collectivist country, right? Guatemala, the most collectivist, right? Yeah, observation here. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the observation was that a lot of the students we label as marginalized are at the um, higher end for collectivism. And that is not by accident. And we're going to talk about inequity by design in a moment. There's nothing wrong with collectivism. I see a hand way back there. Do you need a mic? 
All right, she's coming. Oprah's coming. Hi, yes, I just want to point that um, Guatemala, I'm from Guatemala, and that six, that's perfect. Because for us, education is not a priority. First, you have to make money, survive, and if you can, you can have an education. Absolutely. So I agree totally with you, and it's also a cultural thing. And, and the idea is this doesn't show about how education is important or unimportant. It's how we orient ourselves to others. So you have collectivist countries. Education is just as important. But it, what's most important, the first order of business, is connecting the group to keep the oxytocin high. Right, so taking care of each other, whether that's making a living, getting it, but making sure everybody's well-being is settled before we go to the other things. And this is how collectivism actually plays out when we think about setting it up. Yes. I was, no, I'm from the Philippines. All right, it's coming. At, oh, you got a little sorry. mic there. I'm from the Philippines, and I'm looking at um, the Philippines is a 32, and the U.S. is 91. And thinking about my own family and the expectations that my family has of me and how that sometimes conflicts with who I am when I'm at work. Absolutely. Um, the difference between that. So I almost have to switch when I'm at work versus when I'm at home and how I engage in the conversations I have with my family members. Um, just being able to do that back and forth and... So uh, this, I'm going to pause you right there because you just said something so important, right? That you know that in, at home there's a collectivist orientation in terms of how you interact, um, what your orientation is in terms of what's important and what you prioritize. When you go to work, you actually have to shift your cultural lens and ways of being. Most people of color, most marginalized people that we label marginalized have to do that. Because we are, uh, the dominant culture is co uh, individualistic. Most people of color understand that moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. It doesn't usually flow that other way. Most of our white educators don't necessarily know how to move back and forth in terms of collectivism. Right. This is where we grow our capacity as culturally responsive right. educators. What does that mean? What does that look like? Thank you for that. I saw a hand here. Um, I just, I, I, I'm from India, and um, I thought that India was going to be a lower number, and I'm kind of surprised. Where is India? It's 48. 48. And, um, Absolutely. Because um, I know that the family is, uh, the good of the family is more important than the good of the individual. That's right. And having, I, I want to kind of come across as a parent raising a child in a different culture from my own and then seeing the confusion. Absolutely. Um, of the child because the child is seeing a different culture at home and then the well, mainstream. Absolutely. And the problem that, the, the reason this sets up confusion in our children is we don't accommodate collectivism at school. So we want, we talk about being responsive, but we don't bring that in. We don't educate ourselves to what is that, how would we bring it in, what would it look like, and we're still hitting our educational goals and targets. We have misconceptions around that. So that's where the confusion. I had to raise my children. They, the, one of the biggest confusions for my daughter was she came home and she says, Mom, the teachers want me to call them by my first name. And I'm like, OK, let's have that talk. Um, because in our culture, elder respect is very high. You never address an adult. And it's an age grade system, collectivism is, meaning the next age grade above you, you know, are considered your elders or people you look up to. So once you get to seniors in the society, you never call them by their first name. You never call an adult. That is the ultimate in disrespect. But what happens is we don't honor that when kids come to school sometimes and we have them <clears throat> call adults by their first name. And they insist on it. Oh, call me Mary. And the poor child now is freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I can't call you Mary. And I remember the day my daughter came home. I mean, she was panicked. Mom, what do I, okay, baby, let's sit down, let's have a talk. Right? And we had several of those talks. How do you navigate? Because then this confusion shuts them down. And, that, and it shuts them down in a couple of ways. I totally reject my family. 
in this attempt to fit in, I cannot be myself. The first strike against natural confidence. I don't get to be myself, my full self, right? I have to alter in order to fit in here. So I want to carry on. Thank you for engaging that. And again, this is an area of development and study and understanding. What does it mean to be collectivist? Here's, I want to share a few of what I've come to understand, what I've applied in, in, in terms of my own classroom experience. The first one is not just kids like to be in group because it's group oriented. It's that the learner sees things whole to part. We start with story. We start with the big picture. We start with relevance. And then you learn. The learning is done through apprenticeship. So you have to have this the big picture. Whether you're building a cabinet, this is the cabinet. We're going to build this cabinet. And I'm going to show you all the steps to build a cabinet. So you just don't start building things, right? Take our typical math class. We're going to come and we're just going to do problem sets. Versus, OK, why are we doing problem sets? And you'll hear kids say, this doesn't relate to real life. So we're constantly trying to find how it relates to real life. The whole idea is hold apart. And the neuroscience says, this builds schema. This literally builds cognitive hooks in your brain. It's your knowledge tree. Oh, I see how that's connected to this is connected to that. Distributed expertise, conferring with others when confused, the idea of going to the hive. I had a uh, recent uh, work I was doing in school. Teacher came up and she said, oh, that presentation you did. And she literally had tears in her eyes. She said, you know, I dinged my student because the student was new, had come from Nicaragua, and was confused about something and turned and started talking to the students around him. And I thought he was just being lazy and just talking, and he kept doing it. And I, she just, then he was suspended. Absolutely. But she did not understand. He was just, that's distributed expertise. So this is the idea. This is where turn and talk comes from. But the idea that students, when they are confused, should be able to have ways to seek out that confusion. It's not always teacher controlled. Holistic. Emotions are involved. Senses are involved. Spirit is involved. Individualism is highly technical. Emotion is not usually in there. This is why there's such a drive now for social emotional. Uh, <laughs> it's ironic. Now we got to have whole programs, <laughs> right? Because we now need to help kids with their emotions. Hello. <laughs> it's like that is part of being human. We should not have to go get a curriculum for that, but we do. Because individualism does not usually account for emotion, let alone spirit. And I'm not talking religion. I'm talking about spirit, something bigger than yourself, whether that is nature, whether, what is that? But there's something bigger in a collectivist culture that holds you together, that binds you, be it your ancestors, be it your connection to Mother Earth. Different cultures have a different orientation, but all have an orientation towards spirit. We see no spirit come into the classroom. If culture is the software to the brain's hardware, then our students are not getting the opportunity to wire in the way that they should. The next one is learning by doing. Hands are connected to the brain. We know that when you write your goals down, when you write your notes, when you're learning something, they actually get encoded better. Collectivist cultures have known this all the time. So again, collectivism is about Learning by doing, processing by talking. This is what Vygotsky says, social cultural learning theory. Oh my goodness. Those in col collectivist cultures knew that before anybody had to codify that information. We are not bringing in the wisdom that comes from collectivist culture. And a lot of times we say at cultural assets, those kids have no assets. I have heard teachers say that to me. The idea is how you have to broaden your cultural lens to see something that you may not experience as an asset as an asset. That holistic one, I talked about that again. Learning isn't just technical. 
making sure as you think about it, how could I bring a sense of emotion, a sense of spirit in? What might that look like? All right, here's an opportunity just for you to turn and talk. And uh, my virtual audience, I want to invite you, if you're with a partner or some colleagues, this is an opportunity for you all to talk. If you're by yourself, just maybe a little reflective writing. Three points that resonated, two connections that you're making, a wondering or a question. So go ahead, I'll give you a little time at your table, you guys can share. All right, let's start to wrap up our thought. Go ahead and wrap that thought up.
All right, let's come back together. I know the conversation is just too good, huh? All right, come on, let's come back together. Thank you for that. I think that will help. All right. All righty. There's so much to talk about. What I want to do is take us to the next segment of this. So I want to get everybody's attention. Go ahead and wrap that thought up. I see thoughts still bubbling up and out. Thank you. All right. So again, you know, these are things that you can be talking with your colleagues about. You certainly could be uh, creating some programs of study around. Um, there's so much here. I mean, I can't get into the how-tos, but just letting you know how all these are connected is really what I wanted to be able to do today. I've got about uh, another 15 or 20 minutes of um, uh, two big ideas I want to share with you, and then we're going to make some space for some questions. You know, these can be questions about this or any uh, others that have bubbled up. So um, let's let's carry on. Here's here's a big idea from Doug Reeves. He says, if we don't understand how all these things weave together how we restore trust, how we restore students' natural confidence, then we're going to find ourselves in this left-hand column. And this left-hand column is losing, right? The low result, low understanding of how we get better results, replication of failure is very likely. He says every now and then we see a bump in our test scores or outcomes, and we all do a, the happy dance. Right? And he says the high results, but low understanding. How did you get that? We don't know. We're just going to do the happy dance. Right? <laughs> he says replication of success or repeating that is very unlikely. Instead, you want to be in that right column. That is either learning, low results right now, but all indicators are pointing in the direction that we're going to actually start to get some traction. We see students changing their learning moves. What they're saying is different, so that we know we're headed in the right direction. So ultimately, we want to have high results. We want to have high understanding, so that no matter what kid comes into our classroom, into our school, we can change the trajectory for that child. That is what equity and inclusion is about. We can't, we're not going to get different kids. We've got the kids we've got. So that, you know, stop hoping and wishing for some other kids. <laughs> the idea is to love these into being the leaders of their own learning, right? I want to continue to actually help you understand how that all comes together. So in my book, I talk about the foundation is this idea of the learning partnership, and it starts with rapport. And that's where the neuroscience of trust starts to play a really important role, getting that brain calm, getting that space safe, and not just safe physically, that needs to happen, but safe for making mistakes, safe for failure to be an okay thing, right? That's what you're doing. The next part of that learning partnership is alliance. That just because you say growth mindset, you know, doesn't mean kids will get one. Just because you say this is safe doesn't mean they feel it. So you have to actually build that alliance, and in the alliance, we're going to talk about this, that kids bring something to the table, you bring something to the table, all in the service of getting that kid to figure out how to regain that natural confidence, how to go from being a dependent learner to an independent learner. Last but not least is this idea of cognitive insight. What does that mean? It means the student starts to be self-aware of his learning moves that you use formative assessment as a feedback loop to help the student know when he or she is moving closer to the kind of learning outcome that you want, that he wants, right? That I understand. That becomes a really important thing. So the learning partnership is the foundation of culturally responsive practice because it is ultimately going to help us help the student shift academic mindset. 
And that says, I belong to this academic community. I can succeed at this. My ability and competence grow with my effort, and this work has value to me. That the student has to internalize these ideas. It's not enough to just have them posted on the wall, like, good, we'll read that. But do you believe it? Mm -mm. The student needs to write it on his heart. This has to be a deep value. But there are things that we're doing that erode that student's sense of confidence. So the learning partnership is designed to rebuild that relationship that allows you to be that child's champion, that allows you to be believed when you're trying to lead him into the ZPD. Building the alliance is the reason for that relationship. Students need both care and push. How do you, in a loving way, give not only the care, but the push? So in my book, I talk about four types of teachers. The ultimate is the warm demander. And I'm not talking about warm demander of classroom management. I'm talking about the warm demander of cognitive development. And that is a big difference, because we keep talking about warm demander, like all we're trying to do is control their behavior. They will control themselves when learning is juicy enough. But then we have the other three types. We have the technical. I call them the technocrat. This is a teacher who kind of geeks out on a subject. And the kids kind of like that teacher, because even though he's not trying to build relationship, he's so passionate that it's contagious. And the kids, you know, that's that zany science teacher. He's always doing that stuff like kids like, oh, Mr. Z is so great. But they love him. Then you have the elitist. The elitist, I'm just teaching to the kids who are here. And if you're here to learn, I'm teaching to you. We hear this. Right? That's the elitist. Not trying to build a relationship. It's all on the student. Then there is the sentimentalist. And the sentimentalist, the poor baby, they've got stress in their life. They've got trauma. And they're very friendly. And the kids like them. But they don't necessarily have a lot of respect for them because they know they're kind of skating by. So part of what we're trying to do is help everybody release their inner warm demander of cognitive development. right? And you figure out where you are in that. Because you're going to use the trust that you generate as fuel to push that student into that ZPD. Not push as in you know go unwillingly, but like, I'm going to coax you, because you know this is good for you, but you don't necessarily want to go. You know, we're not trying to jump into the pit. right? We have to get lowered into the pit. So being able to understand that the trust that you build from that oxytocin is literally going to be like shoveling coal into a furnace. You got to keep shoveling it. It's not a one and done. It's like every day you better come and renew that coal of oxytocin, because you're going to have to keep throwing it on the fire, because the student loses confidence. And you will have to come with enough energy to help them back to that spot. Here's what you get as a result of that. Students give you permission to push them. When you are a warm demander of cognitive development, and you have been that, become that child's champion, they give you permission to push. They expect you to, to kind of needle them to step up your game. And they love you for it. When they see adults aren't really making an effort, they think you really don't care about me. You don't care that I'm failing here. You don't care that I'm three grade levels behind. How do we build that alliance so that we can offer them both care and push? But here's a really important part of this. We have to help students counteract negativity bias. What is negativity bias? Think of it this way. Our brains are um, oriented toward trying to keep us safe. And it believes any negative feedback is a danger signal. And you need to focus on that danger signal. So you can get 100 people giving you feedback. 99 pieces of feedback were like, that was great. You were really good at it. That one, like, mm, I don't know. What do we think about that one? We just can't stop thinking about, what did I do? Okay, maybe I should have done that for like 99. But that one, there's a reason. It's called negativity bias. Our brain, any negative feedback is like Velcro. 
and we will obsess about it. Any positive is about, is like uh, um, Teflon. It just rolls off. So here's what the neuroscience says. To actually internalize positive things, right? A new move that you did, a new result, new learning behaviors, the student has to actually talk about it for 90 seconds or more. Because it takes that long to counteract the negativity bias. So what I introduce is a success protocol, a structured way students bring, here's the new learning move I actually, you know, created, changed, perfected. I kept doing this and getting that wrong, but I changed these two moves. So they're not talking about the end result. They're actually talking about, I was successful in improving the way I actually did that math project, or the way I actually did the science, or the way I figured out the reading when I was confused. So being able to help students do that, what we know is that kind of feedback loop builds confidence. So building confidence is not a rah-rah you know, pep talk. It is re we get confidence when we make real progress. And the brain loves that. So again, helping students move from being confused, unclear, to, oh, if I do this, I actually can get a better result. For too many students, it's a mystery. They get a paper back or they get feedback. I don't know what I did. I don't know what I need to change. And therefore, I just conclude I'm not smart. And we are creating this loop for them. This is called explanatory story. What's the story your students are telling themselves as to why they're still struggling? This is the idea that the brain has to make sense of every experience. And it's going to make up a story. And a lot of times those stories include dominant narratives. You come from a particular group. You speak a particular language that's telling you through social media, through commercials through other avenues that you're less than, guess what you, your story is going to conclude? And part of what we have to do is help students rewrite that story. Here's some of the things that I've shared with teachers that we tried and start to get traction with. Letters to my younger self. So as the student is going through, oh, OK, you've had this experience. What advice would you give your younger self just starting this or a younger student in another grade, right? What would you tell them? Because every time the student has to think about them, there's an opportunity for what we call story editing. This is what they use in cog uh, cognitive behavior management or, or adjustment, right? So psychologists, psychiatrists use this all the time to help people not have negative self-talk. Employ the progress principle. So in my book, I talk about this idea of wise feedback. Wise feedback is more than just good job. It's that first, let me acknowledge you're more than capable. Ne next, this was a learning target. You didn't hit it. But here's the feedback. If you go back and adjust these things, I bet you'll figure out how that you could actually get there. And then you conclude with, I got more than enough confidence that you've got what it takes to get this. Right? That's why he sees that. That comes from Claude Steele. Claude Steele talked a lot about stereotype threat. And we have a tendency to want to talk about the stereotype threat, but he gave us a solution. And the solution was wise feedback protocol. But I don't see enough people using that as a way to help students actually regain that confidence. Oh, I can figure this out. Oh, I can change so that I can get better. Right? Employing that feedback so that they get that. Switching from I can't as just a blanket statement rather than I can't, <coughs> not yet, right? I can't do math, not yet. Right? And being able to help students add that on, naming and noticing, another way of micro affirmations. There's a great book out there, I don't know if any of you know it, by um, Peter Johnston. It's called Choice Words. I would put that on the list because this is what he breaks down. How do you micro-affirm in ways that it's just not pie in the sky? Again, kids can suss out when you're just, you know, blowing smoke. And they don't want that. They want real feedback. 
And when you notice and name things that they don't notice because they just brush it off, that's the negativity bias. You're helping them kind of reorient themselves. Find the gift in the obstacle. Right? There's a great book out called The Obstacle is a Way, and it's built on Stoic philosophy. The idea that our struggles reveal information. They reveal a gift. They're not just struggles to, you know, the universe is damning us to struggle all the time. That through that struggle, you actually find maybe a new strength or new realization, right? Some of the scientists' best eureka moments have become, been because they made a mistake or they had a struggle that they had to get through. Help students reorient themselves around that, and that will help them rewrite that story. Here's one teacher's um, bulletin board around yet, not yet. Right? Yet being, you will be able to get it, the affirmation. The other is adding non-cognitive norms. Errors are information, not confirmation of low intelligence. We have norms of behavior, but we don't have norms of cognition. And we need to have these. Ron Rickhart, author of Making Thinking Visible, Intellectual Character, Forces of the Culture of Thinking, he talks about this idea of social cognitive norms. Another norm might be pay attention to how you're processing information to arrive at the answer. They have a tendency to focus on the answer. And we then are communicating to students that the answer that counts, not how you're processing that. Use non-linguistic representations to think. Opportunities to think with pictures and symbols. This is a powerful thing. Robert Marzano, for a long time, put non-linguistic representations of one of the nine essential strategies we should be employing. Because this helps students make sense, and when they make sense, they feel more confident, and that actually flows in a positive direction. So this could be as simple as helping kids learn how to sketch note. Right? I always encourage you to give students' time for processing. And this is not a turn and talk. This is literally you're doing, uh, giving them input. This is five minutes. Take out whatever notebook you have. You sketch if you sketch. You know, how are you processing? This is their individual time for just processing. It could be I process best when I talk to someone. Oh, OK, here's another person who processes well by talking. And all you're doing is giving them that moment. Have you ever used Coinstar? You know, you're taking the big jar of the pennies and the nickels. I forbid my husband to put quarters in there. But, you know, you're taking your coins and you, you dump them in. And, it's, you know, it's eating them up, eating them up. And the little hand pops up every now and then. It says, stop feeding coins in. Processing. It hasn't stopped. It's just like you are just, it's too much. I need to process. Try giving students process time, using sketch notes, using some other ways in which they could actually make meaning, generate those connections. I want to end with an admonishment to beware of the four horsemen of deficit mindset. We have a tendency to want to start new things. One of the things I share with people is think about what you need to keep. You could be doing something right. This is not to suggest you're doing everything wrong. But look at it with a new eye, right? Is there something I'm currently doing that actually is raising the oxytocin? Cool. Keep that. Then you have to think about what do I need to stop? And you need to do that robustly before you think about what you need to start. One of the things that we need to stop is to think about how we are bringing deficit thinking into the classroom. Deficit thinking is the belief that inequities result not from structural racialization, but because there's some flaw with the child or the family or the community they come from. And somehow they need to be fixed. That is what deficit thinking is. And this is different from implicit bias. 
Implicit bias is an individual, oh, okay, maybe I have a view of and I can change that view. This is in our drinking water. This is the dominant narratives about certain groups of kids. So part of what we have to do is be on the lookout. The first horseman is the culture of poverty. Those kids come from a cult. There is no culture of poverty. Poverty is not anything anyone signs up for. It's not a culture. Now, you may be raised in circumstances, but whatever those patterns of behavior are, are coping mechanisms. Right? The Rockefellers may have said, hey, we're going for generational wealth. Nobody ever says, hey, we're going to flip the script. We're going for intergenerational poverty. Yes! <laughs> Nobody. It is not a culture. So the deficit thinking is, you know, that's just how the, those kids are. That's how they are. We then want to blame the family. Family just doesn't care about education. The family is just not, right? Listen to these things that we allow to be said in staff meetings, at planning meetings about kids, the degree to which we learn how to shift, reframe, redirect. It's one of the things I teach coaches and leaders. How do you shift that discourse in a way that's not confrontational? You, don't need, you, you want to keep the oxytocin flowing. But we all need to be headed in the same direction. Then there's the poor baby syndrome. Poor baby. It's got trauma. Right? Well, you see what I feel about the trauma thing. Trauma's not new. Poverty's not new. But we act like it came just yesterday. <laughs> and this happens in two ways. We lower our standards. We are somehow believing that cognitive challenge or rigor is a, a trauma. And we don't want to add to that trauma. Rather than it's a balm. It's an opportunity for the student to thrive. It's the rose that comes up through the concrete. There has to be another view of students who may be in circumstances that are beyond their control, but we don't need to poor baby them. We need to give them the space to find their natural confidence through this. Remember, the obstacle is the way. And how are we bringing resilient strategies from those communities into the classroom? African Americans have survived and thrived because of those resilience strategies in the light of significant trauma. Are we tapping into that? Immigrant families who have persevered and thrived, are we tapping into those resilient strategies? We act like we got to go make up something because they don't have their own, right? This is another way we other marginalize, again, being culturally responsive. What are the ways of resilience that have allowed you to thrive? Bring those in, right? A lot of trauma-informed practices are around that. The third that I want to share with you is this idea of meritocracy, right? The myth of meritocracy, right? Everybody's got on the even playing field, and we know the truth is they are not. We talk about grit growth mindset. Here's the reality. We talk about grit like, you know, it's on sale over at CVS. <laughs> Aisle 3A, they're having a sale. Go get you some grit. <laughs> that is how we talk about it with families and kids. Like, it's just this thing out there. But the reality is kids need to be able to have that academic mindset. They've got grit. The ones that are showing up despite the odds, They've got it. How do you tap that? How do you mirror that back to them and remind them how strong they are? That's the counter narrative we have to offer. We fail to account for the impact of racial stress created by dominant narratives. I want to just say and, and then end here, um, microaggressions are the other thing we have to pay attention to. And that's a much larger. Uh, idea, and I want to make sure I get to the, um, I stop so I can get to some questions because we're almost at 12. So you're going to see me do this. We're going to go through some things that um, I don't have time to explain, but I do want to just highlight that one of the things that I do is share with folks, teachers working in schools, the four cultural learning tools that come out of collectivist culture that really help students process information. 
So when you're talking about being culturally responsive, it's not always mentioning race or class or whatever the, the cultural orientation is. It's about bringing it in so that silently, non-verbally, students' brain syncs up, says, I recognize this. I recognize how this feels. I recognize how I, pro I can process this. Oh, that's whole to part. I recognize that. That's what being responsive is. How can I sync up so the student's brain recognizes this is the way we are going to actually do this? So those are four. That's memory, funds of knowledge, patterns and puzzles, talk and wordplay, and perspectives. So the idea that the brain, these are natural ways that the brain processes information. They become cultural learning tools because most collectivist cultures have a very strong oral tradition. And that oral tradition leverages those neural pathways. Your students come with these neural pathways overdeveloped. You have to tap them. This is the asset that they're bringing that we're not tapping. And they would feel much more confident if they recognize I can already do this. Think about how many of you saw the original Karate Kid? And if you haven't, it's on Netflix. You need to see it. It's good. Um, <laughs> You know, and there was the wax on, wax off, right? We talk about that. And the, you know, the Daniel's son, I want to learn the karate. No, no, you got to wax on, wax off. Kids come already knowing how to do this. And we want them to learn. This is kind of like they're already waxing on and waxing off. We don't realize they already know how to throw those punches. We don't actually see that the thing that they just do naturally. And it's not that they don't want to learn. Have you ever watched skateboarders? There's some skateboarders over in Berkeley, by Berkeley High, where I, I uh, live. I just sometimes go and park because they are trying to skate along an edge and they fall. And I'm like, what gets into you <laughs> that makes you want to get back up there? I saw you fall five times. And they kind of shake it off <laughs> and get back up there. Why do we not? trigger that level of stick to investigativeness in school. That we know they are more than capable of going into that pit when they want to figure out how to do that skateboard trick. What is it that we need to do to make what we offer them that juicy and that sticky? I have so much that I could share with you, but we don't have time. And here's what I'm going to do. Don't even worry about FOMO. That'll just intrigue you. I want to end with this quote. And this is a quote by Atwell Gawande. He wrote the Checklist Manifesto Mortality. He is a heart surgeon and an author. I don't know how he does that, but he's brilliant. And he says, better is possible. It does not take genius. It takes diligence. It takes moral clarity. It takes ingenuity, and above all, it takes a willingness to try. So I just really want to encourage you, start your own action research. Start your own collaborative inquiry. Figure it out. These aren't plug and play things. What are you currently doing that you actually want to just grow? What are things that you're doing that you, like, I need to stop that, like, tomorrow, right? But this is the joy of being an educator. We get to continue to be responsive to our students are and grow our own practice in the, in the process. I'm going to pause there. Um, any questions? We've got about 10 or so minutes. Um, and I want to use that time so that you guys have questions. If there's folks in our virtual audience who have questions, uh, it would be great. And I think we've got some mics. About anything. We're collecting cards. Cards? Oh, are the cards Deck with cards. questions? Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I've been that way. There you go. Here's one right there. Right here. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's, let's just do lunch and. <laughs> Chop it up sometime. Well, here's the thing about it. I do do, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you in a moment how you can get more information, because I do do a quarterly webinar. I do a free monthly call. I have a Facebook group where if you've got questions you wanted to, I, 
because we're in this together, right? All right, how can we book you as a presenter? Okay, that's a trick question. <laughs> Let's get a real question going. But, and, and honestly, if you wrote that, we could talk later. Any more questions? Right here. Hi, um, what recommendation would you give a site administrator who wants to begin to do this work with mm -hmm. their staff? What's the first, what, what's your recommendation as a first step? I think the first step is, I, I can break it down into three steps, but first I can tell you what not to do. You don't, get, you don't have a PD session and say, we're going to have somebody come in and do a PD session, even for a whole day, because it doesn't translate. So what... I ask leaders to do, and when I usually work with the school, the first order of business is I work with the leaders. So with that, I, that slide I showed you in terms of shaping the path, that's what we do. And I ask them to build their muscle around talking about these things, right? That's that um, FOMU, right? FOMU is the fear of messing up. So we have a tendency to not talk about cultural responsiveness, anything that has to do with equity, some racial dimension, because we don't have the language. And so the first order of business is to get the language before you're trying to lead people. And that means working with a small group of folks to do that. Then there's about building capacity. So I ask teachers, usually on the le instructional leadership team, to do collaborative inquiry for at least a semester before they start rolling it out whole school. Some group of teachers who are the sparks to actually do that because then when their colleagues see this is how we get students to change, then it's not seen as just a bucket of strategies because it is a multi-dimensional approach. It's not a bucket of strategies. There are operationalized strategic tips, tools, and strategies to use, but you don't start with here's the strategy, right? Because there's not a one plug-in thing that's going to work for everybody. So it really has to be with building capacity of the leaders to talk about this in terms of they know what they're talking about, starting with we're not talking about multiculturalism or social justice. Or, do you know what I mean? So that there's that learning that you have to do and then build, shaping that path for your leadership team so that they can shape the path for the rest of the staff. You're welcome. Any others? Any more questions? Any from out in cyberspace? No virtual? Okay. All right. Everybody's chewing on it. Well, look, I think um, I've given you a, a good amount to chew on. Thank you. I'm hoping you had a wonderful conference, and the rest of the weekend will be great. Thank you. We also have books out for sale that Zaretta has, and if you bring a book back, she'll sign it for you. How's that? Yes. And here, here is where if you text this number, 44222, and put that message in it, you'll get a cute version of that chart I just shared. Ooh. All right? And then you'll be put on my uh, mailing list for my newsletter, so you'll learn about all those other things I just talked about. All right? I just want you to know I've been on her mailing list, and it's good. You want to be there. Thank you very much, <laughs> Thank you Loretta. Very well, um, we appreciate everyone being here. Cl everyone clap for yourself virtually and in person. <laughs> Woo! It has been a party and a half, right? Hopefully you're all um, leaving rejuvenated and excited, full of passion um, that you want to carry to Monday, by the way. Um, and so we are going to end with uh, our Dream Achiever band. They're going to be coming in in a few minutes to play for us. And we're going to be passing out ice cream in the back. So we um, really appreciate Ready uh, Rethink Learning has sponsored our ice cream today. So be sure to um, thank Crystal Weber. Are you here, Crystal? There she is. Thank Crystal for providing our ice cream today. And I want to thank everyone for attending. We're going to do it again next year. Oh, my goodness. Um, we even have dates in the program, which is frightening. And um, we hope everyone will come back. So thank you, everybody. I want to thank my staff. All my volunteers, and we're going to wash our shirts again. And um, especially a shout out to Kim Bovario and the Inclusion Collaborative staff for making this happen. So thank you very much. We're actually ending a few minutes early, and uh, the band will be in here in a moment. So thank you.